small change because Lukas Lena that's supposed to talk about lift. I really wanted to hear that. Got sick, is sick, and he is not able to do it today. So instead, I will try to improvise something about Vico, Vico, and, and Scala. But if anyone, if any of you want to tell something or if you want to discuss something, I, I, I'm more than happy to step out. So. Or we can just decide that we don't want to see uh, the second presentation today and just like grab a beer and hang out. So it's up to you. But firstly, as planned, uh, Pavel will tell you a little bit about cats. And one, once well, 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 he will be ready, I think we can start. Here. So, Pavel, are you ready? Yeah, sure. So, go on. And take a mic. Maybe? Or not? I don't know. Hi everybody, I'm Pavel, I'm Scala developer at Virtus Lab. Just a quick reminder, there is a pool of uh, free drink coupons at the very end of the, of the room, so if you haven't done so yet, you can just help yourself and come up to the bar and grab your free beer. Uh, today's presentation is about CATS, that's a library for, for Scala. Uh, the name is somewhat playful, it just derives from category theory. You can think of categories as stuff like groups or fields, like group, uh, in mathematics, just some abstractions over uh, some, some entities, uh, like functions in our case. Uh, we are not basically going to delve into this theory that much. Uh, we are just going to show a couple of useful, um, of just a couple of use cases of the library in actual production code. That's basically around 10, the most useful 10% of CATS library that you uh, ever gonna utilize in any, any production code. Is it clearly readable for all of you? Okay. Um, so, yeah, just, just for the sake of completeness, um, that's an entry that you have to put into uh, into build SPT, just one liner. Uh, all the examples are for Scala uh, to 11 further in the presentation. Okay, so let's first start with just as a warm up. Uh, that's not really rocket science, just a, a helpers for just a couple of helpers for option and for either. Mostly useful in unit tests actually, but also happens to. Uh, unclutter. We also happen to use them to unclutter our production code as well. Uh, there was a problem in our unit test that were they were heavily cluttered with stuff like future successful from some from something. I mean, we are just mocking results of uh, some service method calls that returned a future option something and we just ended up with a lot of future successful sum uh, result values. So that's pretty, that became pretty hard to read, just a lot of parentheses and a lot of nested values, and it was pretty hard to retrieve what's actually returned from the service uh, in, the, in the test. So uh, yeah, let's say we got a method like get user by ID that returns future option of user. And to unclutter the tests that for, for methods that return future option user, we can just use the uh, helper called, called dot sum, which is a method sum, uh, and then a method as future, which we can implement ourselves. Uh, that's the syntax like that, so just chaining sum and as future at the end of returned value is much more readable, especially if you have a lot of calls like that uh, in your unit tests. And sum, as such, this helper that is pretty much equivalent to sum, like sum apply or option apply, uh, comes from the package cat syntax option. We're just going to return to these uh, packages because they are pretty important. Um, somewhat analogical helper, but for left and right, uh, is called s left and s right. 
Uh, they come from the package cat syntax either. And they serve pretty much the same purpose in our code base. So just to unclutter uh, the, unit, the return values uh, from mocked methods in unit tests, uh, they, just, they just make uh, unit tests much more readable because you avoid like, a lot of nested parentheses. And you can just focus on what's really important. So what is actually returned from the, what is expected to, to be returned from the mocked method rather than uh, what this value is wrapped into, which is usually not that important. Yeah, that was like somewhat trivial. Uh, let's just quickly mention, also as a matter of introduction, let's just quickly ma mention um, how CATS is organized. I think that's pretty common pattern for li for all libraries, so this can as well be used in your library, whatever you, whatever kind of thing you implement. Uh, basically, most of the useful goodies in CATS is uh, located either in one of CATS syntax packages, as we had just uh, just a minute ago with CATS syntax dot option and CATS CATS syntax either, or CATS instances. CAT syntax option are basically packages or other uh, CAT syntax either, CAT syntax, let's say, traverse that we're going to come across uh, quite soon. Uh, those are packages that basically contain a bunch of implicit classes and implicit conversion just to pimp the existing classes and add some new functionality that was not there before. Let's say we can just add, uh, by the means of CAT syntax option, uh, we just import an implicit class that adds a sum method to, to, any, uh, to any class, to any type. Uh, same with either with traverse, we can, for instance, as we're going to see in a couple of moments, uh, we can just add a traverse and sequence methods to objects like uh, lists or options. So basically, that's, that's just putting uh, some implicit classes into the scope and pimping, extending. Uh, the existing classes so that we can use some extra syntax uh, that was not available before. And the counterpart of syntax packages are instances packages and they in turn are uh, putting some, importing them, puts implicit instances of type classes into scope. So let's say for uh, the sum helper that we had before, there is no need to have any type class instance we can just call sum or on any object. But uh, in case of the like traverse method that we're gonna see in a couple of minutes, we actually need to, we need the guarantee that the object that we call this traverse method on actually has some specific properties. And this is done like as, as a general pattern in Scala or in Haskell, it's done with type classes. Uh, some implicit instances of, of type classes. Uh, so yes, uh, so for, for most syntax to use, we need to import both the uh, cats, uh, the proper cats syntax package and its counterpart cats instances package. Uh, there is a couple of um, default instances for option list, future and other typical uh, typical uh, classes using Scala. Uh, for slick DBIL, which is also kind of very extensively used in production code. There is no standard instance in CATS, but there are a couple of quite simple implementations out there in the web. Uh, one of those is, is, is uh, supplied in this GitHub repository. Uh, sometimes, especially at the beginning of your adventure with CATS, it might be somewhat difficult to determine which of those uh, packages are actually uh, necessary in your case. So it might be easier to just go the lazy way, uh, import cats implicits, which basically imports circa about the entire library into your scope. The problem is that it uh, puts a lot of burden on the compiler. Uh, just I guess some of you might have attended the uh, presentation on Scala Sphere, the tooling conference back in March this year. There was a guy who actually dissected uh, why um, the, the, compiler, the compilation times of Scala code are so long and it boiled down to the conclusion that actually most of the time is spent doing uh, the implicit resolution. 
Um, also a couple of other things, but, but basically for, for most of the benchmark, it ended up just in conclusion that this modus, most of the time is spent doing implicit resolution. Uh, so if you decide to just import the entire CATS library, which is pretty vast, um, into every single of your, let's say, all of your services, repositories, DA, DAOs, and so on, uh, you might end up like uh, having your having your code compiled very very long. So it's better to to just import the packages that are actually necessary in your case, so like cut syntax and cut instances. Anyway, if you when you start this, when you just start playing with cuts, you can just uh, you can just stick to uh, cuts implicit because most likely what you need is already included there. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with some with some more concrete stuff. Uh, this is about Cartesian builder, Cartesian syntax. This has something to do with combining stuff together. Uh, let's say we have such a such a situation that we have three methods. Each of those, let's say they 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 might as well uh, accept some parameters, but we we're gonna skip that for now. Uh, they return futures, or the DIOs, or some other objects of similar property can be as well option or list. And uh, we have a method that accepts three parameters. First of them is mm, integer, so the type of the compute int, um, the result of compute int. The next one is contents, which is string. And this is basically the the uh, return type of the on the second future, and uh, the third one is user, so the type of the third future. And we want to apply this function to the results, to the combined results, to three results of those three futures. Uh, this can be done somewhat awkwardly with map, uh, but there is a better solution for that, which also. Uh, which also runs all, the, all, the, all of those three futures in parallel. Uh, that's called a bar at bar operator, like this one, like pipe at sign pipe, the single operator. This can be imported from cat syntax Cartesian. Um, and what we do is that we combine all those three futures. This can be imagined as well as um, doing a Cartesian product of all those three futures. So we are just combining them into something that is of type Cartesian builder, but we don't really care about that that much. And then on those combined three futures, we call it map. And this map, as opposed to regular map on, let's say, option or list, this map is, as you can see, is trinary. So this map somewhat unusually accepts three parameters. Uh, one of the type of the first future, the other one contents of the type of string, and user of type of, uh, of the third future. If any of those futures uh, happens to fail, to fail, so just um, end up being a future failed, with some exception, uh, the entire uh, Cartesian product will be failed as well. So we will end up with a future failed as well. We can as well uh, just shorten this syntax to somewhat even just, just to one liner, we can do an eta conversion of on process methods and just uh, just just uh, express this at, at express that as process. This this is uh, strictly equivalent. Next part uh, is about a process called uh, traversing. Or actually, we're gonna start with sequencing and then go on to traversing. This is somewhat unintuitive. I guess it took me quite a lot of time to actually get used to this way of thinking, but it happens very often in, in production code. Uh, let's just start with a basic problem. We have a list of futures, or a, let's say, option of DBIO, or option of future or list of DPIOs and so on. In general, we have two nested contexts, and the outer context is something like option or list, and the inner context is something like uh, future or DPIO. And anybody who ever tried to do anything with a list of future 
without swapping the types, so without making that uh, future of list. Uh, I guess certainly, certainly remembers how difficult it is to, to do anything with that. So this, this kind of nest, this way of nesting context is pretty awkward. We would rather have future of list or the BIO of option. Um, so the way to do that, the way to transform list of future, like on this picture, into future of list, is just a just a sequence uh, method, which is available via an implicit implicit class uh, from the syntax from the package cat syntax traverse. Uh, for for cats to know how to uh, do the operations that swap future and list together, you should as well import uh, cats instances future and cats instances list. So importing the syntax package actually uh, makes the sequence method available, but for the sake of sequence methods to work properly, so that it knows how to transform future and transform list, uh, you will need to import the corresponding instances packa packages. So if it were, if foo uh, were a dbio option string, you would need to import corresponding, just still the same cat syntax traverse package, but also the uh, corresponding packages for um, type class instances for option and for dbio. So that would be like cats, instances, option, and so on. So let's go further with that. Uh, that's also a very common problem that happens pretty much in, in one in three service methods, I guess. Uh, you've got a list of objects of some type, let's say A, and you have a function that converts A to future of some other type. And uh, let's say A is user ID in our case, and A is, uh, let's say A, A is user. Uh, that should be user actually, sorry, <laughs> not user ID. Okay, anyway. Um, and you just want to, you just, and you, ha you have to implement having this uh, basic deck, you have to implement the function that processes a list of users and returns a future of list of user. Let's visualize that with a graph. So we have a list or, of uh, object of one type. You have a function that converts the, uh, the, the object of this type to a future of some other type and you want to end up with a future of lists of objects of some other type. So the first, the first suggestion that comes to mind is just to use map, but the problem is that you will still end up with a list of futures. If you just map every single object in the list with this function, uh, you will still have a list, but with, with a, um, of whose every, every element will be a future. So that's not the way to go. We can just use sequence that we, uh, that we came across before. So we create a, a list of futures via a map call, and then we call sequence uh, from cat. So map is just the, like the regular list map, regular, regular list method, and sequence is a method from cat. And thus we end up having a future of list. Uh, but, and this is a, a valid solution, but uh, just a quicker way to do, that, to do, to do those uh, will be a call of, a call, um, of traverse method from cats. Uh, this is pretty much the same pattern as we have with map and flat map. So uh, you can always implement flat map in terms of map and flatten call, but nobody really does, so it's just like easier to squeeze that into flat map. So pretty much the same, map and sequence squeezes into, into traverse. So let's show a uh, implementation of process all users method. So we have a, uh, a method, uh, we have a, a parameter users of type list of user. Um, that's not presentation about docs. Uh, uh, and we return a future uh, we have to return future of list of users. So we just call traverse 
on users uh, passing the method process user defined before as a parameter, and that's it, just a one liner. And for the sake of doing that, you would need to import um, cats instances for future and list, and um, cat syntax for traverse. Somewhat more exotic case, which also happens, I'd say, like a couple of times less frequently than the case for Traverse, but still pretty often. Uh, you have a list of objects of some kind, and a method that maps object of this kind into not just future of some other type, but future of lists of some other type. So for this case, you have like three A's, and a fu function that maps each A into two B's. Uh, you would want to end up having a future of list that contains six elements. Uh, that's slightly different case. You can as well do that doing map, uh, sequence, pattern in, in proper order, but there is just a uh, there is just a nice <laughs> a nice um, helper for that, which is called flat traverse. So kind of traverse plus flatten, and it's called like flat traverse, just as like map and flatten is called flat map. Okay, and. Uh, Let's proceed to the to the final section, uh, which is the mono transformers, and I guess this is pretty much the most commonly used stuff, at least in our code base. Most services actually, yeah, I guess mo like three fourths of service methods in in our code base uh, return uh, option T or either T. That's both mono transformers. Let's start with uh, option T. T is actually for transformer. Uh, that's, that can be imagined as a wrapper over F of option of A. So option T of, let's say, future or the BIO. A can be, can be understood as a simple wrapper over future or the BIO of option of A that um, adds a couple of methods that are not as easy to do when you have just a vanilla uh, future option A. Um, yeah, that's the problem you, you will encounter pretty, pretty uh, often in your uh, production code. Uh, you return a lot of future option A from services, and mapping over them is a real pain in the ass. Let's say we have, if, when you have just one uh, future option, that's kind of, kind of pretty easy. Uh, you just uh, map over the future with the first map, and then you do maybe value dot map. So you just map over the enclosed option within the future. But let's say you have, which is kind of very often, the, the very frequent case, uh, you just have two uh, future option ints, and you need to get to the values that are enclosed, to the int values that are enclosed within those future, and do some operation. Uh, with those ints. So to do so, you would need to first flat map over the first future, then then split over the cases of some or none. You can just do that with fault, but it doesn't matter. Uh, then in case the first future is sum, is defined, uh, you can uh, map over the second future, and then just within the the, the uh, most nested scope, you can just do something with both value one and value two. So in this case, if any of those futures is failed, you will end up with a failed future. If any of those future is uh, a successful future, but with none inside, you will end up with future none. So this is pretty expected. Uh, if, if any of those, con if any of those fu contexts is um, some kind of failure, the uh, resulting future should be also a failure of the same kind. So this is correct solution, but kind of very verbose one. Uh, let's now rewrite that with uh, cats data option T. The first case, so with just a single future, uh, ends up uh, you will have a option. So you just uh, take the result future, wrap it into option T, and then do a simple map. This map, uh, the one that has, that has the value parameter, uh, this map doesn't map over the option, it just maps over the value enclosed within the future and within the option. So it's a kind of map that goes two, level down, two levels down. 
uh, if uh, the if result future is failed, the result of this operation will be also a failed future. If uh, result future is a successful future that contains none inside, the result will be a successful future that contains none as well. But if uh, result future uh, is successful and stores some defined some value with some int enclosed inside, you will just end up uh, with another option t future string and the value inside will be just this int value mapped with your function. So that's pretty neat. Uh, that's even more visible for the case with two futures. Just as in the previous example, you have result future, another result future, and then you just do a neat for comprehension. In the first enumerator, you are just mapping over the option t, uh, in result future wrapped into option t. The another enumerator uh, iterates over a result future 2 wrapped into option t. And in this way, you just have easy access to value, value and value 2. You can just do whatever you want with, this, uh, with those two values. If any of those future, just again, uh, as the same as it was with the, um, in the previous implementation. So if any of those futures is failed, the result will be failed. If any of those futures is um, a successful future with none inside, the result will be a successful future with none inside. And only in the case where uh, when both futures are successful and Def and what's inside the future is, is defined, you will end up with a future that is successful and uh, has your mapped value inside. Um, option T is just a simple wrapper that's basically a case class with a single field called value that's of type future option something. So just to go to future option A from option T, you, it's enough to call value. In this case, uh, we used flat map and map under the hood because we just uh, expressed it with a for comprehension, but it later compiler transformed it into flat map and map calls. So definitely map and flat map are defined or on option T. Uh, you can as well do some what more exotic operation that don't occur in lists or options or futures. Uh, but are defined for on, on monad transformers like subflat map or semi semi flat map. Uh, all of those basically just take the uh, just go two levels down to the value enclosed within future and within option. Just take this value out, and th that's a value of type e, just type sorry a, and then apply the function that you provide, uh, and and you always end up with uh, some other option option t. Uh, just what what's the difference between those methods is just the same kind of difference that you have between uh, map and flat map uh, for for the case of future or for the case of option. It just they just differ by the return type of the provided function. And actually, the bits that we are using most, uh, so the functional way of of modeling the flows that can fail at some other point without using exceptions. Uh, it's either T, especially of future. Uh, so just a wrapper, as the same the same way as uh, option T was a wrapper over future uh, option of some value. Either T, either transformer, is a wrapper over future or some other context of either of A B. Uh, that's a way of dealing with services that return future of. A lot of, let's say you have a lot of service method that's return future either of something. That's a good way of dealing with uh, possible exceptions that can be thrown within service calls, but still it's pretty awkward to map over them. Let's say you have a lot of your, mm, your method consists of a couple of calls to other service methods, and each of those service methods call return a future either or something. So if you want to map over that, like in this case, you have two values which are of type future either something, and then you you would like to map over uh, those two values. So uh, that's the code that serves for this for this purpose. It's kind of acceptable if you have just two of them, but um, if you have a service method which is kind of usual, 
uh, if you have a service method that calls, let's say, five other services, uh, this might end up looking pretty unreadable. So you can just squeeze it into such a simple for comprehension. Um, you wrap both result future and result future two into either T and just uh, do a for comprehension over, over those two either T's. So e, now, if any of the future is failed, the resulting either T, so map to result either T, will as well be a failed future. Uh, if any of uh, of those either's are, and if any of those futures contains a left, so either T which is not right but left, you will also end up with a um, future that contains a left inside. So that's a fail fast behavior which is kind of familiar from the exceptions in Java. Uh, but if both, both of result future and result future 2 is a future that wraps a right, uh, then you, your mapping function, whatever that is, uh, that maps to int into string, uh, will be called on the enclosed values, and you will end up with a future that wraps a uh, right inside. So that's pretty good uh, for constructing flows that can fail at any moment. Let's say you have like five service method calls, and each of them can fail with some exceptions. Uh, if the for comprehension uh, comes across a method that ended up with a left, it will just instantly uh, break the flow and uh, return from the for, for, from the for comprehension with a uh, future of left. And the same as it was the case with option T, op either T is just, there is no magic, it's just a simple case class that wraps a future either value, so you can just call uh, you can just access the enclosed value calling dot value method. But in fact, we don't really use vanilla future either a b uh, in our code too often. We are just sticking to either t and option t pretty much everywhere. Um, and this works pretty well and pretty seamless. Just at the very end, at the controller level, we are uh, moving away from either t's to futures just to map them to some HTTP result. But other than that, we are just sticking to either T's across the entire code base and it simply works. And as it was the case with option T, uh, either T has an arsenal of some bazillion methods. Most of, it, most of them are pretty not that much useful, but uh, definitely you definitely want to use map, flat map, also semi-flat map. It's pretty much the same as it was with option T. Mm, either T is as, as it is the case with either uh, in Scala 2.12 or, or with, uh, yeah. yeah, with either in Scala 2.12, it's right biased. So all of those methods map over the right hand, right value um, if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it just sticks to left. So map maps the B value if, the, if it exists and uh, flat map maps the right value to another either T. Mm. That's the behavior which is not implemented on either in Scala 2.11 because you don't have a map or flat map method or either in, in this Scala version. In Scala 2.12, they, as far as I know, they finally decided to make either right biased. So um, you have map and flat map methods and uh, they, they stick to the, to the right side of either, uh, which is kind of more natural uh, behavior. Um, also use, uh, that's not really either the specific behavior, but we, uh, there's one pattern that just pretty much often occurs in our code base and just just would like to share that and maybe you have some comments whether, uh, whether you, you uh, consider it a good practice or a bad practice. Mm. We have a DBIO that uh, corresponds to a transaction that can fail with some domain exception. So uh, let's say we are just doing some, some work in the, in the data, database uh, transaction and we, have, we can have DBIO failed at some stage because of some, let's say, discrepancies in the data or whatever domain condition. And at this point, Slick, Slick uh, triggers rollback of the uh, database transaction 
and we end up with a um, failed future. So now, uh, after we run this transaction on database, we would like to recover uh, so that we don't propagate failed future. So what we do is just we map uh, we map the future uh, wrapping the enclosed value into write. So this map as write, and uh, to handle the failed future case, we are doing a recover. We um, catch the domain exception, whatever it can be, and just map this exception into left. So this way we end up with a future either of um, the left side is some domain exception and the right side is the expected result of the transaction. And at the end we, just, we are just wrapping that into either T so that we can handle that easier with, um, in let's say, services. We can map over that easily. We can just combine that in for comprehension flows with some other uh, results of service methods. Just before we finish, a bonus of some uh, practical IntelliJ tricks that are useful in general, but especially useful when you are using a lot of uh, cuts loaded code. Uh, most of them I guess know, but maybe somebody for some value, it's, it's going to turn out helpful. Uh, alt equals, that's a, uh, there's also con control Q, I guess, for this reason. Uh, just the, the shortcut that finds type for the uh, selected expression. Or in this case, it, it will show us a, a, a tooltip that hints that the uh, selected expression is future of option of option of int, which is, which kind of sucks. We should do a flat wrappers in this, in this place, but. Uh, uh, but that, that just by the way. Um, it's pretty important for that uh, and also for the following two shortcuts that you always have to select a proper uh, proper compiler expression. I mean the one that doesn't have any trailing tabs and spaces at the end. So just a expression that strictly, strictly maps to a node in a syntax tree uh, parsed by the compiler. Otherwise um, IntelliJ won't be able to find a type for the selection. So it, in most cases it's enough to use Control w shortcut, so widen selection. Sometimes it can fail, but usually it's, it's just enough to, to use Control widen so that the selection strictly covers one node of the compiler tree. Uh, Control shift p in turn shows implicit params that were applied in the expression. Uh, that's pretty useful because as we have, um, in this place we have a, um, a expression where we are traversing over an option with uh, some function that accepts int and returns future option. And for cats to do a traverse on option, they have to um, have access to implicit uh, instances of type classes for future and, uh, and option as well. Uh, so we can check uh, whether those um, implicit uh, type class instances are available by selecting the expression and doing control shift p. It works just for any code, it's just not cut specific. Anywhere where uh, some implicit params were passed to a method, you can just select the expression and, um, and do a control shift p in IntelliJ. Maybe slightly less useful because uh, um, up to me actually implicit conversions should not be overused. Implicit classes are okay, so just extending classes by adding some new methods it's a very cool pattern, but implicit conversions as such are very misleading. But anyway, if you happen to use them or if some external code base uh, forces you to use them, you can do Control shift q select, select an expression and IntelliJ will show you implicit conversions that are applicable for the selected in the selected expression, uh, and the one that is highlighted is the one that actually that's actually used um, currently in the expression. Thanks for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, there, let's go, or we can just uh, chat after the uh, meetup is done.
Oh, that's a tricky question. Uh, cat's magic as far, I'm not really sure what, ca what, what kind of cat's magic you're referring to. I'm aware that nested, for example, is not working, which was not mentioned in this presentation, but I don't know any cure for nested not working in cats. Not sure if you, if you mean anything else. Is it like an IntelliJ compiler setting? Yeah, is somewhat yes, accessible? Yes, yes, the presentation compiler for Scala. There okay. is such a setting. So you can try it out. That's one way to do so. <laughs> uh, in some cases, yeah, there, is, there are some hacks that... I just observed that there are some hacks that uh, you should... Yeah, especially in four comprehensions with either, um, I, I sometimes end up having the... Uh, red squiggles in IntelliJ, even though the even though the, the code uh, just checks under Scala C, but usually it just helps to add some extra explicit type parameters. That's what helps for me at least in yeah with either T's. In general, well, uh, as Vishek would said, <laughs> use Scala IDE. <laughs> but in the end, you put more type definitions and make your method smaller. This is not a good fit. This is not a bad thing. If you do like too many, too much magic and mix a lot of strange stuff and be like this big for comprehension, if it's not supported by IntelliJ, maybe it will also be not supported by your colleagues and the code is a way to complicate it. Yeah, there's, there's a kind of implicit warning for you that, yes. well, that would theoretically compile, but do you really want to put the things that way? Okay, so it seems the questions are over, so I would pass the microphone to Krzysiek now. Uh, guys, do you want to take a break and like grab some beer and like take a turn and start in turn?